Hold it up. Hold your Bible up. All right, that's great. Let's turn to Acts chapter 10. We have a, a lot of ground to cover today. Uh, Warren, Warren said I need to slow down. So I'll try to work on that. And you try to listen faster. So we'll try to make those two merge in the middle. All right. Um, we're addressing the subject today, one blood. Uh, unless you've been like Rip Van Winkle, uh, you've probably heard in the news that there's a lot of emphasis today on the subject of race. And... Uh, Probably too much emphasis. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, we're going to address that subject. Since it's in current events, what does the Bible have to say? And we're getting ready to read 35 verses in what I have dubbed the most misunderstood chapter in the book of Acts. Who could come up here today and, and explain Acts 10? And what the Bible says about the salvation of Cornelius. Who, who could come on this platform and explain why Cornelius spoke in tongues before he was baptized and what that means? Well, that's not our point of emphasis today, but you need to know the answer to that. Now, there was a certain man of Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man, one who feared God with all his household, gave many alms to Jewish people, prayed to God continually. Cornelius was a, was a good man in the eyes of men. About the ninth hour, be about 3 p.m., he clearly saw a vision of an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? He said, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial to God. In other words, God heard Cornelius' prayer. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. I'm in verse 6, Acts 10, verse 6. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. Simon was staying with, with Simon. <laughs> When the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants, a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants. And after he explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. That's not in Harford County. That's in Israel. On the next day, as they were on their way approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. That'd be what time? 12 o'clock noon. He became hungry, was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. He saw sky, the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners of the ground. And there were all kind, in it all kinds of four-footed animals, crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. Verse 13, a voice came to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Arise, Peter, kill and eat. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, arise, kill and eat. Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time, what God has cleansed no longer call Consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up in the sky. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions from, for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. They came from Caesarea down to Joppa on the sea coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Cornelius lived in Caesarea. Calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. But get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. Peter went down, verse 21, to the men and said, Behold, I'm the one you're looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by an angel, holy angel, to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. So he invited them in and gave them lodging. The next day, verse 23 still, he got up and went away with them and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. On the following day, he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and he had called together his relatives and close friends. Okay, Cornelius lives in Caesarea. An angel said, go down to Joppa and get Peter. 
He's going to come and talk to you. And Peter went with those three men that, that, that were the messengers from Cornelius. And he took six men with him, which is in the next chapter. But Peter takes six men with him. Okay, let's, let's uh, go on. When Peter, verse 25, entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up saying, stand up, I to him just a man. He talked with him and entered. He found many people assembled and he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit with him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. That is why I have come even without raising any objections when I was sent for. So I asked for what reason you have sent for me. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Well, Peter was getting ready to preach to non-Jews for the first time. Cornelius said four days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour, 3 p.m. Behold, a man stood before me in shining garments. He said, Cornelius, your prayers have been heard. Your alms have been remembered before God. Therefore, send to Joppa. Invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear all that uh, you have been commanded by the Lord. Oh, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Well, Peter said that. He didn't always get it right after that. We'll get into that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we gather in this hour, this wonderful opportunity, oh, how thankful we are for your word and this wonderful story, Lord. Because I have an idea that all of us who are here are Gentiles too. And you didn't just send Jesus for the Jews. Yes, first in line, but we're thrilled, Father, to be second in line. Uh, And and, uh, in some ways, Father, the last to become first. So, Lord, as we develop this message, perhaps not a sin that is in anyone in this audience, but that's all right. Uh, We need to hear from your word, and your word is right, and And have the proper proper biblical perspective. So would you educate us and inspire us that we might give the right message to a messed up country that God is not a respecter of persons. But whoever fears him is welcome to him. We feel welcome at your feet. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Two drunks were walking down the street in dire need of a drink. Didn't have any money. And so they concocted a plan. One drunk picked up a frog. He said to the other drunk, from now on, this frog is a mouse. Okay. Frogs and mouse. Kept walking down the street and they came to a tavern, a bar. The first drunk walked in and he walked up to the bar and he said, what kind of establishment is this? Why, when I came through your door, the first thing I saw was this mouse. He opened up his hand and there was a frog. And the bartender said, that's not a Mouse, that's a frog. And the drunk said, no, that's a mouse. And they argued back and forth. And finally, the the, the drunk said, I'll bet you $20 to any bottle of whiskey in this bar that this is a mouse. Well, the, the bartender knew a pretty sure bet when he saw one. He said, all right, you're on. And the drunk said, to prove my point, we'll let the next man that walks into this tavern decide what this is. In walked a second drunk. 
the bartender invited him to sit down. He said, uh, what is that that man's holding that second drunk? I said, well, well, that's a mouse. And the bartender said, no, that's a frog. And the second drunk said, no, that's a mouse. The first drunk said, that's a mouse. They argued back and forth. Finally, the bartender said, all right, you win. He reached behind the bar, grabbed a bottle of whiskey, and put it in the first drunk's hand. And he said, you know, the first time I looked at that mouse, I could have swore it was a frog. Now, what's the moral of that story? The moral of that story is this. If you say something long enough and loud enough, after a while, people will believe it, even if it goes against their conscience or what they know is not true. I suppose after Adolf Hitler said over and over again that Jews are inferior people, people began to believe it, even though they knew in their conscience That just wasn't so. We're being told in our country loudly and longly that America has a systemic problem with racism. That's kind of a word I'm getting tired of hearing. Along with new normal, some other words. What does that word systemic mean? Well, it means that this is a major problem. We're being told by the media and other, uh, uh, other people of influence in our society that we have a major problem in America with race. And that America is, is shot through with people who are racist. Now, what I'm getting ready to say is true. Not that what I previously said has been false. It's true too. But our current president and current vice president both believe that America has a major problem with racism. After the jury rendered its verdict in the Minneapolis police officer trial, a man named Derek Chauvin, a name that's become a household word in our country, and Kamala Harris, within just a short time, addressed the nation from the White House, and she said, and I quote, America has a long history of systemic racism. Black Americans, and black men in particular, have been treated throughout the course of history and of our history as less than human. Black men are fathers and brothers and sons and uncles and grandfathers and friends and neighbors. That's true. Their lives must be valued in our education system in our health care system, in our housing system, in our economic system, in our criminal justice system, in our nation full stock. Close quote. That's a quote. Within just a short time of the jury rendering its verdict. However, sometimes those men, black men and white men and Asian men and Chinese men and Native American men, sometimes... They're criminals too. Did you know that George Floyd and Dante Wright and Andrew Brown, and two in Minneapolis and one in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, all had previous criminal records? And all three resisted arrest before they tragically lost their lives. You disagree with the police in court, not on the sidewalk. When the police put you under arrest, they have authority of of the state, and you're to submit to them, not oppose them. All those men opposed the police and lost their lives, uh, unfortunately. After the vice president stepped back, our president took the podium and he said, systemic racism is a stain on our nation's soul. I didn't know America had a soul, but that's 
what he said. There, there, it is true, there has been some race problems in our country. That's not untrue. I don't agree with his statement, but 200 years ago and even less, even less than 200 years, there were slaves in America, black slaves. We had a war. I'm well familiar with the war between the states. It was about states' rights. I'm aware of that. I'm fully aware of that. There was a race element involved in the war also. My research indicates between 1880 and 1930, 4,000 blacks were lynched in America. Between 1880 and 1930, that's a stain on our nation. I played baseball for two years in high school. I wasn't very good because the third year I got cut. <laughs> But our, I was on a JV, but our high school, our varsity coach used to say, I was with the Yankees about that long, back in the 1940s. He said they were playing minor league baseball in Birmingham, Alabama, and had a black man on the team, and he was forced to eat in the kitchen. And I don't remember anything the high school coach taught. He wasn't a very good teacher, at least in my opinion. My opinion, he might have been a good teacher. But I remember he said, I went in the kitchen and I ate with it. I remember that. I remember that story. Then on April the 15th, 1947, Jackie Robinson broke baseball's color barrier with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Tragically, on April the 4th, 1968, civil rights leader Martin Luther King was gunned down in western Tennessee, the city of Memphis. June the 7th, 1988, in a place known as Jasper, Texas, Sean Barry and Lawrence Brewer and John King beat James Byrd, stripped his clothes off, and then they did something that is unconscionable. They tied this man to a truck and drug him three miles. And I'm not going to get into the rest of the details because there are simply, simply two Ugly for me to think about. James Byrd died. Brewer and King were eventually executed, and rightly so. Barry is serving life in prison. However, with all that being said, our country's come a long way in 245 years on the subject of race. So much so that Jussie Smollett when he was looking to, for a hate crime, he paid two black men to say that they, they, they abused him and they eventually turned on him. And I want to ask Jussie Smollett, couldn't you find one real racist to, to do what you wanted to do? He had to pay two guys? Couldn't you find one? I think Hitler could find all kinds of them in Nazi Germany, but Jussie couldn't find one. So he concocted a fake crime that blew up in his face. So our country's come a long way, even in the last 40 years. So much so that then I'm, I'll be done with my introduction. On, I think it was Wednesday night, maybe Thursday night, Tim Scott, governor of, not governor, senator of the great state of South Carolina, the, the Palmetto State, said, in one lifetime, my family has gone from cotton to Congress. Powerful statement. In one lifetime, my family has gone from cotton to Congress. Well, let's approach this subject now with this lengthy introduction from three directions. And first of all, let's talk about the cause. What's the cause of this problem that has stained our country? And you're always going to have people who use drugs. You're never going to get rid of drugs. You're always going to have people who are pedophiles, aren't you? You're always going to have people uh, who are drunks. You're always going to have people who are perverts. There are always going to be some racists around. There's a big difference in that and saying our nation is shot through with those kind of people. The text for our message addresses the subject of ethnic superiority. The Bible has an answer for anything that comes along. <laughs> Here it is. For the first 10 years of Christianity, 
Who were the people who were candidates to become a Christian? Only Jews and some half-breed Jews known as Samaritans. They were the only people that were allowed to become Christians for the first 10 years of Christianity. That's the way God wanted it because Romans 1.16 says, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God. That's the word dunamis, from which we get the Greek word, the English word dynamite. It is the dynamite of God for salvation for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the non-Jew, the Greek or the Gentile. Because God chose the Jews to be his people in the Old Testament, some of those Jews had developed a smug, self-righteous, privileged attitude. And I'm here to tell you today that Peter was one of those people. He's now a Christian, but he's a fledgling Christian. He's a new Christian. And so God had to work several miracles to get the Gentiles through the door of the church. He sent an angel to Cornelius and said, dispatch some men down to Joppa. There's a preacher down there. Go get him. And, and while those men were coming, Peter was on the rooftop and he, had, he, he saw this vision. He saw, he saw this sheet come down. And in that sheet was ham and chitlins and pork chops and sausage and bacon and crabs. All kinds of good stuff. And the Lord said, arise, Peter, kill me. Peter said, I, I, I've never eaten anything like that. And the Lord said, don't you call on holy what I've called clean. God wasn't talking about food. He was talking about people. And then when Peter got to Cornelius' house, God had to work another miracle. Cornelius and his family spoke another language they never studied so that it would get Peter's attention that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Let's talk briefly about what causes prejudice. What causes prejudice? First of all, prejudice is caused by arrogance. It's caused by arrogance. Another word for arrogance is the word pride. The Jews, as I've already mentioned, thought they were superior to the Gentiles. The fact that God chose them went to their head. God told Jonah, who was a Jew, to go preach to the Ninevites, and they weren't Jews. Jonah do that? No, he went the opposite direction. And after a whale of a story, Jonah went. And he preached to the pagan Ninevites, and they repented. And guess how Jonah responded? He got mad because God saved him. Yeah, arrogance and pride. Jesus told this story in Luke 18, 9 through 12. He told about this parable to to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Notice that? They viewed themselves as righteous and other people with contempt. Two men went to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Pharisee stood praying thus to himself, God, I thank you I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, tax collectors, like this tax collector, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. I'm a great guy. God, don't you think I'm a wonderful guy? (laughs) No, he didn't. The publican didn't even lift his head, and Jesus said, which one do you think these men were justified? He said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, but... There have probably been men who've prayed, oh God, I thank you that I wasn't born a... You could put in the, you can fill in the blank. Yeah, patting themselves on the back for their ethnicity. I'm talking about modern time. So Peter and his evangelistic team, six men, next Acts 11 tells us, they had Jewish pride, but now they're Christians. And that's why God had to work several miracles to get their attention. Acts 11, 2 and 3 says, after they went back home, here's what happened. When Peter came to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Those men who said that were Christians. They were Jews who became Christians. But when they found out that Peter had gone to non-Jews and preached to them, that's what they said. Summarize that for me. How? How dare you? How dare you do that? Those people are lower than dirt. (laughs) You can't do that. Yeah. Uh, Prejudice is fostered by pride and arrogance, but it's also fostered by ignorance. 
while you're writing that down, reminds me of the, the coach who was frustrated with his basketball player. He said, son, what's your problem? Ignorance or apathy? The player said, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Peter was ignorant. He was ignorant about how God felt about the Gentiles. He thought because the Jews were God's chosen people, that meant that non-Jews are nothing to God. That was not true. And people are ignorant. Some people are ignorant in our day and time too. You see, all of us have Noah as our grandpa. Did you know that? Noah is everybody's grandpa because Noah was the, the patriarch that came off the ark. He had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They had three wives, eight, eight people. We're all cousins. What do you say, cuz? Every human being has Noah as their grandpa. And Acts 17, 26 says, he made from one man. Who was that one man? Adam, every nation of mankind. That'll dissolve it, huh? Live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation. God made from one man Adam. He made Adam in his image. And so everybody else who followed in succession. Now, some of you have seen this video on Facebook. But um, uh, Allison, can, can you show that? Uh, and maybe you can pull the house lights down if you would, please. Can you find, hit that grandmaster? How many of you have seen this? Oh, half of you. More. But we don't have to have the sound. Now hit play again and just show the first part of it and with, of, of them run, and then shut it off, Allison, after it goes to that. Now you can shut it off. Am I causing that feedback? Nobody is born a bigot. Nobody's born a bigot and that video proves that. We got to hustle along. Number two, the contradiction. The contradiction. Let's go back to Acts 10. About 10 years before Acts 10, Jesus told Peter and the disciples to go into all the what? All the world, preach the gospel to who? Every creature. But when Peter heard that great commission, you know what he heard? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every Jew. <laughs> he didn't hear every person, he heard every Jew. <clears throat> so after seeing this vision and hearing these men uh, from, came from Cornelius and an angel had sent him, here's what Peter said, Acts 10, 28. He said to them, you are, are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate or visit with the Gentile. I don't know that that's true, but he said it. You know, it's against our law for a Jew. At least that was, that's where their, their customs had grown to anyway. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. You see, Peter's life as a prejudiced Jew and now as a prejudiced Christian was a contradiction to his father, God. His life was a contradiction. God had to get rid of that ethnic superiority. Had to get it out, rooted out of Peter. So... Several miracles, angel, the vision of the unclean food, the speaking in tongues. But let's note three spiritual contradictions that result from showing prejudice. The three spiritual contradictions that result from being prejudiced. Number one, the example of Christ. Remember WWJD, what would Jesus do? Remember those bracelets 25, 30 years ago? What would Jesus do? about this subject. Well, here's the answer to that. Now, this is what Jesus' enemies said about him. Matthew 26, 16, 22, 16. 
And they, the Pharisees, that is, sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know you're truthful and teach the way of God in truth. Defer to no one, for you, for you are not partial to, anybody, anyone, to any, anyone. <laughs> when your enemies say something about you that's true, guess what? Probably is. <laughs> okay? And, we, and so, <clears throat> that was, they were right about that. They, they understood that Jesus was what? Impartial. Here we go. Here's a better, not a better example, but another example. John 4, 9. At the woman at the well, therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it you being a Jew ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. <laughs> Jesus crossed two cultural barriers when he talked to her. One, the ethnic problem of ethnic superior of the Jews. She said, how can you, wow, you're a Jew. What are you talking to me for? I'm a Samaritan. I'm low life. Jews don't talk Samaritans. And also, I'm a Samaritan. You know, men don't talk to women in public. Jesus broke two cultural biases in talking to that woman. Yeah. You see, prejudice is a contradiction to the way Jesus lived. When I was a little kid in Sunday school, I, I learned this little song, and you maybe did too. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. That prob- song would probably be called Racist Today. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. I learned that song, and maybe some of you, I'm sure you did as well. Jesus never covered anybody's sin. He never excused anybody's sin. But Jesus always protected a person's dignity. Yeah. You see, ethnic superiority is a contradiction to how Jesus acted. But secondly, another contradiction is the sacrifice of Christ. It's a contradiction to the sacrifice of Christ. Yeah. Jesus said in John 12, 32, And I... If I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Jesus said he'll draw who? Peter heard all Jews. Jesus said all men. All men. Hebrews 2.9. We do not see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels. Jesus, because of the suffering of the death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. He might taste death for everyone. Who's that leave out? Jesus Christ died for every person, no matter what their ethnic origin is. So racism is a contradiction to the life of Christ and the blood of Christ, but it's also a contradiction, thirdly, to the evidence of heaven. It's a contradiction to the evidence of heaven. Heaven Heaven simply belies racism. Revelation 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain. Who, Who was? Jesus the Lamb. And purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Jesus' blood was shed for every ethnic group. Rick actually is a preacher. I quoted Rick in our Sinai Summit series, 11 Sermons on Ten Commandments, because uh, he wrote a book on that, and I read, that was one of the books I used for resources. Uh, Rick preaches in an a cappella church of Christ, several thousand, down in Fort Worth, uh, Texas. And Rick said, I'd say in his mid-60s, maybe a little older than that, but he said when he was 16 years old, that would have been back in the 60s or late 60s, early 70s, somewhere in there, early 70s, late 60s, somewhere in there. He said he saw two ladies in their church, and they were looking at a bulletin board of missionaries, pictures of missionaries baptizing people in Africa. He overheard one of those two ladies say, I don't like the thought of those blank being in heaven. And 
And that's exactly what I put in my notes. Those ladies don't have a thing to worry about. They have nothing to worry about. And so Rick preached a sermon at age 16 on racial... He said, the elders told him he'd never preach in that church again. Yeah. But heaven <laughs> decries that. Revelation 7 verse 9 says, And after these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation. You see, there's more than 144,000 in heaven. <laughs> All tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. Who's in heaven? People from where? Every nation. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, pantata ethnos. In Matthew 28, 19, that's the Greek into all the world. The Greek is pantata ethnos, means every people group. That's where the word ethnicity comes from, the Greek word ethnos. To every ethnicity is the Great Commission. Lastly, our last point, what's the cure? How you get rid of this viper of sin that I, I, I feel confident today is not in any of you. Uh, but it's, it's a subject we can address. It's in current events. And so we need to know the biblical, the biblical uh, perspective on that. Two points here quickly. The first one is examine your heart. Examine your heart. Peter got it right, didn't he? He said, I, I recognize now that I can't call anybody unholy that God's called clean. Right? He, he got it right. However, did you ever have a problem with a sin? You thought you'd gotten rid of it and then it, then it reared its head in your life again? Ever had that happen to you? Galatians chapter 2. When Cephas, that's the Aramaic name for Peter, means rock. Came to Antioch, I, Paul said, I opposed him to his face. Can you imagine the apostle Paul rebuking the apostle Peter? Because he stood condemned for prior to coming to certain men from James, he used to eat with Gentiles. Peter used to eat with Gentiles. But when they came, who came? When the Jews came, he began to withdraw. Withdraw from who? That's right. And hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The, right? The rest of the Jews joined in with his, in his hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas, even the son of encouragement, Barnabas got carried in with that. So Peter had a relapse. Let's, um, we didn't live back then. The Jews had been taught that they were superior. And so they had some things to get rid of as the church progressed. We might have been like them uh, in the things that they had to root out of their life. Now I'm going to give you an example a little closer to home about examining your heart. Sometimes young preachers We'll rush in where angels fear to tread. Uh, my first ministry was in Western North Carolina. My first two ministries lasted six years, both of them. I guess that was uh, about all people could put up with me. So, but I got ready to move. We got ready to move in 1996. And a, a man at church came to me. He said, and I quote, do you know what sermon you preached here that I respect you for the most? Well, now how do you answer a question like that? You can't answer a question like that. I said, no, I have no idea what he's going to say. He said, and I quote, the sermon you preached on racial prejudice. Right here it is. This is the manuscript that I took to the pulpit 27 years ago. Here it is. Older than some of you here today. These are, this is the sermon right here. And he said, and so I think maybe in the South, I was in the South, North Carolina is below the Mason-Dixon. There might have been some prejudice in that man, but he examined his heart and got it right. I have a preacher friend, he's a little older now, but when he was young in the ministry, he heard in the South, a man that had been a Christian more than 50 years 
making an ethnic joke about our president two presidents ago. And here's a young 27-year-old, 26-year-old preacher having to take a 70-some-year-old man aside and say there's no place for that in the kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. Got to examine your heart. Last thing you got to do is become colorblind. Become colorblind. Yeah. First Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7 says, The Lord said to Samuel, Not consider his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. Samuel didn't want, <laughs> want God's choice to replace Saul. <clears throat> the Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That doesn't mean that outward appearance doesn't mean anything to God. It does mean something. But um, Samuel told us, uh, the Lord looks at the heart. In 1 Samuel, that is. The Lord said. Galatians 3.28, I'm about finished. There's neither Jew or Greek. There's neither slave or free. Man, there's neither male or female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Well, let me ask you a question. Does that mean that when you become a Christian, your, 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 your gender's changed? No. So, if a person has a certain ethnicity, when they become a Christian, they still have that ethnicity. But what's the point of that verse? The ground is level, brother, at the foot of the cross. We're all equal. That's what that verse means. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Gentile, slave or free, rich or poor, male or woman, male or female. We're all one in Christ. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Romans 2.11 also says what Acts 10 says, for God does not show partiality. God does not show favoritism. The King James says God is not a respecter of persons. Means God is impartial. Martin Luther King's Martin Luther King Jr. said, and I quote, I look to a day when people will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. When's the last time you heard that statement? That statement needs to be dusted off and and spoken to the world. Because Martin Luther King Jr. was about promoting people's Equality because they're human beings, not because they're this or that. Blanca's here today. I think she's with the children, isn't she? Uh, uh, Blanca has a son, Juan. You know Juan. Juan was born at 20, 24 weeks gestation, weighed one pound. Dr. Ben Carson has operated on Juan several times. I heard Dr. Ben Carson say recently, and I quote, when I crack open that skull, it's not black, white, Asian, it's human. Yeah. He got it right, didn't he? He got it right. In conclusion, what's the conclusion to this message? There's only one race. The human race. There's only one race.